Hey, Tom the Nutritionist here, and I'm with my good friend, Dr. Alan Christensen, and uh, gosh, Alan, you know, we're at a conference, and every time I'm at a conference, I'm just wowed by you, because you're always like at least six months ahead of the trends. You're always thinking about the science of the future, and you're bringing it to today, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's Alan up to today? And you, you, you shocked <laughs> me with an idea, and you said something about, you know, we're looking at all these people who are doing paleo diets, we're looking at all these people who are doing low-carb diets, and you mentioned that that might not be the best possible thing for blood sugar. How is it possible that the blood sugar in a low sugar diet isn't benefited? What's going on? You know, for openers, I should mention that people are different. We're learning some bits about that with genotypes we can predict, and we've got a lot more to learn. But for many people, this is one of several examples to where what seems intuitive is not quite how biology plays it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems intuitive that if poor regulated and high glucose is bad, no debates about that, that if you would just starve all the incoming direct sources of glucose, you would get lower glucose. Uh -huh. Seems so tidy and simple. Right. But the problem is that we generate glucose, we create glucose. And if we're lacking incoming sources of that, we work harder to generate it. And I've huh. seen many people, when I track their glucose scores for 24 hours a day for several days back to back, if their carb intake is too low, their glucose levels are higher than if they would have had some carbs. Okay, so people are going on low glucose diets, they're going on these carb restricted diets to level out their insulin, to yeah. level out their sugar in their blood. And what you're saying is you've run studies and you've seen that over these 24 hour periods that if people aren't consuming enough carbs, their glucose, why? Why is their glucose going up? Well, and that's the thing is that it's bad enough for glucose to be high, but it's really bad when the body is in a crisis state. And there's a lot of overlap between this cortisol hormone and all of its jobs that it has. It manages our state of crisis, of fight or flight, but also it regulates our blood sugar. So if we have too little glucose coming in, we dump this big surge of cortisol to pull it out. It's the same surge we would make if we were being traumatized or if we had some major stress around us. Okay, so let me get this straight. What you're saying is we have a single response to a stressful situation. It's the secretion of a, a stress hormone called cortisol. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if we're getting chased by a lion. It doesn't matter if we're in a car accident. And it doesn't matter if we're starving or starving of enough glucose. Yeah. We're going to secrete this cortisol. And when we do secrete this cortisol, it will spike our blood glucose. Is that about right? Yeah, it'll run higher. And it's a, it's a bad thing across the board to have excess cortisol and poor regulation of blood sugar, but there's some times of day where it's worse than others, and bedtime's the worst. <laughs> yes, okay, so what's the solution then? So let's say I'm on a paleo diet, let's say I'm restricting a lot of my carbs, and let's say I'm still kind of gaining weight, I have a couple extra pounds, what's the solution, what do I do? Well, here's, here's a little bit more depth on that too. So on a very strict paleo diet, there certainly are many carbohydrate sources, but the difficulty is, there are not many low fructose carbohydrate sources. Mm. And there are not many carbohydrate sources that are rich in insoluble fiber. Uh -huh. So those two things, fiber total, but especially insoluble fiber, and then lower fructose, those are nice things to make cortisol not spike as much. Uh -huh. And that's pretty much grains and beans to get those. Pretty much grains and beans. Now wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> we just mentioned in the same sentence, uh, paleo and grains and beans. So um, are you saying then that perhaps it's not such a bad thing to have a little bit of grains and beans in the diet because it would, number one, regulate blood sugar, mm -hmm. and number two, keep cortisol levels down? Is that yeah, what you're saying? For sure. There's also a big effect upon the bowel flora by maintaining a certain amount of insoluble fiber. There's no shortage of soluble fiber from plant foods, and those foods are so good. And so many people just lack that. One of the biggest problems we have is a lack of good variety of plant foods. But at some point, it's nice to round out that soluble fiber with insoluble fiber. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So can you give me a case study? Like we were just talking about somebody that you and I both know. Can you give us a case study of someone who was on a lower no grain, no bean type diet who benefited from this? How does that work? Sure, I can think of a case right off the top of my head. There was a gal who went through a, a recent clinical study that I did mm -hmm. and she had been struggling to achieve weight loss and had really been at a place of resistance. She had most recently been on a pretty extreme low-carb diet 
and had been on, we had measured her resting metabolic rate, yep. and she should have done fine losing weight, consuming about 1,200 calories a day, but she was not, you know, she was clearly not. She was maintaining a weight, her BMI was roughly about 32, and we saw that by adding in some good carbs, timing them properly, grains and beans, and probably being a little bit less restrictive on the calorie load, she was able to see a shift of roughly seven pounds over the first two weeks. Wow, wow. So what does that look like then in the afternoon? What does that look like in the evening? How much is being added? You know, and, and by adding, I should clarify this too, any time that you change your diet, there is an adaptation response. Sure. So people often consume, uh, confuse what is a short-term effect from what is a long-term shift. Uh -huh. If someone has really not had denser sources of good carbs for quite a while, especially if they know they might be sensitive to legumes, right. a great trick is to do a tablespoon a day for a couple weeks. Yeah. You know, phase it in gradually. Yeah. So how does it look? I encourage consuming roughly half a cup of grains or beans, and certainly sometimes better than others, and of course gluten-free, and then a midday, and then a cup with an evening meal. You know, within the context of healthy proteins, lots of produce, some good, some good fats with there. And okay, so easy. We're saying half a cup afternoon, mm -hmm. one cup in evening, yep. and if you are a person who might have a, a negative response, has not been on these complex carbohydrates for an extended period of time, particularly the beans, right. then maybe just a tablespoon at a time over a couple of weeks, building up then the adaptation sure. and the flora. To, in, in order to process or metabolize these extra. And I should be totally clear, that's half a cup and a cup of the cooked versions. So we're cooked not, versions, <laughs> yeah. Not, that like, not like a cup of uncooked rice, because yeah. that's either you cook it, you can be a lot of food, and if you don't cook it, you wish you did. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so then uh, what I'm hearing then is, perhaps a little bit of grains, a little bit of beans is going to help us with blood sugar, it's going to help us with cortisol. What would be some of the other negative side effects of having elevated cortisol? Yeah, so in a state of elevated cortisol, your body is always in storage mode. So yeah. whatever calories you've got, you're putting here. Right. And yeah. you'd love to take those calories and make glycogen yeah. and make some glucose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> make stuff you can power your brain and fuel your dreams and energize your muscles. That's okay. what your body needs. Absolutely. So we're talking about weight, we're talking about lean muscle development. Yeah. What about contribution towards other diseases? Is there any increase of inflammatory conditions? Are there any inf uh, increases of autoimmune conditions? Autoimmune conditions increased. Whenever we have cortisol rhythms off, that does disrupt the immune response in general. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to have this morning spike and this nighttime shut off. Yeah. And if we're lacking a healthy rhythm, that does disrupt the immune system. There's also very strong evidence that that rhythm may be the strongest predictor of all-cause mortality, especially cardiovascular. Wow. And then one, one thing that, that people are always come to me about is, you know, their mood, number one, and their sleep. Yeah. So how would this affect people's mood and sleep? Yeah, you know, we're making sleep as a hormonal effect, too. We've got this daytime cortisol spike, nighttime shutoff. But we've got this inverse world of melatonin. Right. And we need to have actually a good insulin response in the evening to draw in our other amino acids and leave tryptophan by itself to drive our melatonin and serotonin formation and get good deep restorative sleep. So what I'm hearing you say then is, is the amino acid that's primarily used in the brain to make serotonin that becomes melatonin is tryptophan. Mm -hmm. And when we consume carbohydrates that spike our insulin, that then that draws in some of the competing a specific amino acids compete for blood brain barrier passage into our brain. So I'm thinking about like some of those old Gomer Pyle movies where the soldiers are all standing out and okay, all the volunteers take take a step forward yeah. and all the smart guys take a take step, step back, back and yeah. the one guy's left by yeah. himself. That's tryptophan. So that's tryptophan. Yeah. <laughs> so with the insulin response, you know, so all those guys step into the muscle and tryptophan's let itself in the bloodstream to travel up to the brain and you're happy and you're going to go to sleep happy and going to sleep <laughs> okay <laughs> so what i'm hearing you say then man if I, if I have this correct is that maybe for some people that adding in this half cup in the afternoon cup in the evening grain beans might make us leaner mm -hmm. might make us happier and stronger and sleep well yep. is, it, is that about right that's about right there's so many facets of health that are circadian. There's yeah. these little rhythms that go on with like every hormone, every neurotransmitter, every digestive regulator, yeah. they're all on this rhythm. And cortisol is like the big 
conductor of the band. Yeah. And when it's when it's out to lunch or it's not knowing what it's doing, the whole orchestra's off. Wow, fantastic. Okay, so what would you say to people who say people can't heal from leaky gut without getting rid of all grains and beans? What would you say to people who say, but what about the phytic acid and what about the lectins? Phytic acid and lectins, those are things that act differently in lab situations than they do in the body. They're compounds that do bind with nutrients in a food and they do change how much nutrient we get from the food. Many people kind of misperceive that to think that they somehow sneak inside of your body and pull out the nutrients you've already got. And it, it doesn't work that way. If you had, and that's actually part of how nutrient assays are already factoring in. If you've got you know, 150 milligrams in a serving of azuki beans, that's factoring in the fact that some of those, it's already bound up there in the plant with the phytates. So it's not that those phytates are gonna come and pull that out of your body that you got. It means that a small amount may be less absorbed. At the same time, there's a lot of data saying that these are good things for the immune system and they cut our cancer risks and they're healthy for us. Yeah, they challenge the intestinal environment sometimes, actually when people are starving and they have certain lectins, it actually stimulates the intestinal cell activity. So what we're saying is the anti-nutrient mindset to say that these compounds that have been in nature for millennia are harmful might be misconstrued? Well, and, and to take it further, it would also be inaccurate if they were the big concern to say that their only sources are grains and beans. They are in nuts and seeds. They are in a big variety of other foods that somehow don't go under that that worrisome uh, category <laughs> or don't get viewed that way. <laughs> Interesting. So in general, what you're saying is take a deep breath and uh, consider a little bit of grains and beans. Is that about right? <laughs> you know, I think that being in a state of fear and panic about, about the diet is more detrimental than the diet itself. <laughs> because it spikes cortisol. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you gotta eat well, we gotta be cautious yeah. about that, but there's a certain state of equanimity and a certain state of knowing that, you know, having some confidence, having some balance and doing it in a way that's gonna serve you. Fantastic. Alan, I can't thank you enough. You know, number one, it makes me happier and more relaxed to think about my plate this way. And, and number two, you know, you're going to educate us to think openly about a lot of different things, I imagine. So thank you for your time. My pleasure. Always good to see you. Tom. Nice seeing you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>